10. I like unit 10 because this is the unit that gets us, actually gets our buyers and sellers under contract, which is one step closer to getting everybody to closing. So class is kind of like a progression. It kind of tells a story. Um, so we've created agency, right? Now we're gonna get them under contract. Um, we got hit financing next, next, we'll get to go to closing. Closing's a fun unit too. I like that unit when we get there. So where we are, we are just starting in unit 10. And before we get into it, just again, reference, you don't need to know these numbers, they're just here for your reference. But these are the commission rules uh, that kind of go along with this unit. 58A.0111, this is the commission rule that prohibits brokers from drafting. Guys, please always remember, I am not an attorney. I cannot draft legally binding documents. Only attorneys can do that. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Um, 58A.0112 is requirements if a broker is using any pre-printed form. So we're gonna learn in just a second that we are provided with forms to use. But those aren't the only forms we are allowed to use. We can pretty much use any form as long as it was drafted by an attorney. But specifically with the sales contract, Commission Rule 58 .0112 says if you're using anything other than the forms provided to you, then there are certain requirements of this forms in order for us to be able to use it. So again, just starting out with a reference, we will talk more about this and welcome. So unit 10 starts on page 270. And again, the highlight of this unit, the star, is our offer to purchase and contract standard form 2T. This is one that's provided by the North Carolina Association of Realtors. You guys see this up here, that's what that stands for, NCAR, North Carolina Association of Realtors. So you have the National Association of Realtors, which is the state level, the national level, excuse me. And then we have the state level, which is the North Carolina Association of Realtors. And that's where most of our forms come from, including the standard form 2T. As we said though, guys, please, then this is a problem topic. I think sometimes we get it stuck in our heads that NCAR forms are the only forms that we're allowed to use. And that's not true. We can use any form as long as it was drafted by an attorney and it meets the requirements of rule dot A, A dot O one one two. We're not getting into specifics in this rule in this class. Uh, you'll spend a little bit more time with it in uh, post licensing. So NCAR forms, they're just the co most commonly used. Uh, for example, it's not uncommon for builders to have their own forms. So if you're helping a buyer buy a new construction, they may have their forms that they want you to use. That's okay, we're allowed to, as long as it meets these requirements. And when it comes to our contracts, a couple of things we kind of need to know about us. And the big picture about us is that we do not belong in the sales contract. We are not a party to the contract. Let's talk about our sales contract. Who are the parties to the contract? You have the seller and the buyer. The real estate agents are not a party. So the big picture is that we don't belong. Uh, there's only one place that we put our name as a representative of the buyer and or seller. Specifically, the commission says we cannot make any mention of our commission in the sales contract. We need to have all of our commission hashed out and agreed on before we're ready to present an offer. Who wants to remind me? Who wants to unmute and remind me where we discuss our commission? If I can't talk about it in the sales contract, where am I talking about my commission? Where are we agreeing to my commission? Listing. Listing is one of them. What's the other one? 
Oh, the buyer's agreement. So any agency agreement, absolutely. Listing agreement is one of them, buyer's agreement. Our agency agreements are where we hash out our commission. Would it surprise you guys if I told you there have been reports down at the commission of agents slipping themselves in a bonus in the contract, thinking that everybody would just sign it, not know what they're looking for. That doesn't fly. That doesn't work. Again, you guys, our only job is to fill in the blanks and the blanks that we fill in are very specific and there's nothing there that talks about our commission. The other thing specific that the commission says that can't be in the contract is any liability disclaimer to protect myself. So let's say, for example, the, um, the buyer waives the home inspection. I can't slip something in the contract stating that because that has nothing to do between the agreement between the buyer and the seller. If the buyer chooses to waive the home inspection, that's entirely on him. I actually have another form. We have a form for that, that we can ask our buyers and sellers to select or waive different services. So they handle that, our need to put this liability disclaimer in to protect ourselves. They handle that need by creating the other form. Again, we don't get into that form in this class, uh, but you'll need it in post-licensing. But that's the form that protects us. If they don't want the home inspection, they can waive it. If they don't want this, that, and everything else, they can select or waive the services that they're going to use. Uh, skipping ahead in your book from page 270, let's skip ahead to page 284. What we are skipping is the offer to purchase and contract again in your book is out of date. So when we look at the contract in just a second, we'll always go to the online learning system. But on page 284, we talk about something called the Uniform Electronic Transactions Act, also known as U UETA. There's the state level of this as well. That's the North Carolina. Uniform Electronic Transactions Act. It's also referred to as the NC UETA. These are the rules that we have about electronic documents, electronic signatures. Basically, what we need to know is that once parties agree to do an e-signature, once they agree to do the e-signature, they are agreeing to allow that e-signature to count as your binding signature. I think, well, I know you guys had to do an e-signature for Lane to be in this class. Have you ever noticed how your e-signature looks absolutely nothing like your, your wet signature if you were to sign with a pen and a piece of paper? And what this rule says is, yeah, we understand it doesn't look like your wet signature, but you agree to use this. You agreed to allow this to count. I'm sure when you guys got that agreement from Lane, you all clicked on the terms and conditions and re read those very carefully. Why are y'all laughing? No, right? <laughs> so when you read those terms and conditions, that's one thing you would have seen is that your e-signature counts as a binding signature. So the UETA addresses uh, electronic, the e-world. So let's talk a little bit more and again, about this whole idea of offer and acceptance. Uh, yesterday, when we were rattling off our essential elements of a contract, we referred to it as mutual assent. So mutual assent is the same thing as offer and acceptance is the same thing as the meeting of the minds. So the offer or makes the offer to the offeree. Who's the offer or? Don't say buyer or seller. Who's the offer or? They are the give or of the offer. The offeree is who? The receivee. Again, please don't get it stuck in your mind, buyers and sellers. I want you guys to focus more on the ors and the es. And then that way you're prepared for these some of these test questions. So we introduced you yesterday to what I call the contract communication law. We'll call it that. So buyers on one side of the communication wall, the sellers on the other. And in most cases, not all, but in most cases, the buyer starts as the offer or that makes the offer to the seller who's the offeree. When the seller receives, or see, I just did it. When the offeree receives an offer, 
they always have three choices. Let's rattle those off together. What are the offerees three choices? They can accept it, reject it, or counter it. That was really pitiful. What are the three things they can do? They can accept it, reject it, or counter it. So anytime an offeree receives an offer, they have three choices, accept it, reject it, or counter it. If they accept it, they are agreeing to all of the terms exactly the way they are. There are no changes with an acceptance. If they reject it, the offer is dead on the table. Nobody's out anything. Nobody owes anybody anything until and if a contract is formed. So if an offer is made and it's rejected, people just go about their lives as if it never happened. Nobody owes anybody any money. It's a few minutes, take some time out of our lives. But once it's rejected, it's dead on the table. And guys, when it's dead on the table, there's no reviving it. There's no bringing it back. So rejection kills the offer. And then our third choice is a counter offer. A counter offer is a rejection. That's important that we understand that. A counter offer is a rejection with a but. The offeree becomes the offer or the roles reverse. And now the buyer who made the offer to the seller, now they are gonna receive a different offer from the seller. So the seller rejected the buyer's offer with a but. Counter offers usually sound something like, I'm good with all the terms, but the purchase price and the closing date. So we've agreed to some of this stuff. We've agreed to some of these terms, but now we got to agree on the purchase price and the closing date. So the ball goes back in the buyer's court, the roles reverse, the seller becomes the offer or the buyer becomes the offeree. The offeree, the buyer has three choices, right? What are they? They can accept it, reject it, or counter it. I hope to have you guys dreaming about this tonight. So now the ball's in the buyer's court and pretty much what they have to accept or reject is the purchase price and the closing dates. You guys with me? Because that counter offer, we've accepted everything else on, or conditionally, not officially yet. In just a minute, please bear with me. In just a minute, we're gonna bring real estate agents into the mix, talk about how we are involved in this contract communication wall. But before we do, I'm also gonna talk about forms of communication. What's an acceptable form of communication? So we're getting there. There is this magic moment in time when it goes from being an offer to a contract. And it's really important that we know this magic moment in time so we know when our buyer and seller is officially under contract. And in order for this magic moment in time to happen, in order for the offer to become a contract, we must have two things happen. So in order to go from an offer to a contract, the last offeree has to accept for your exam. When you see that it's been accepted, know that it's been signed. I'm just gonna put this out here. Here's the real world. In the real world, if you got verbal acceptance, you have absolutely nothing until it's signed. In the real world, we have to have a signature, must. In pre-licensing world, when you see accepted on your test, you don't have to stand there and wonder, was this oral or was this signed? In pre-licensing world, I'm telling you, when your test says that the offeree has accepted, know that it's been signed. Everybody with me? Don't, web, don't question if it's oral acceptance or not. So the first thing that has to happen is the offeree accepts it. And then the second step, the second thing that happens is that communication of acceptance has to cross the line and go back to the offer or. The person making the offer 
has got to know that their offer has been accepted. Kind of makes sense, doesn't it? If you make an offer and you never hear back from them, you're not under contract because you don't know that that has been accepted. You don't know that that contract has existed. So let's walk through the scenario. We have a buyer. They fall in love with a home. Uh, maybe they have an agent, maybe they don't. Again, I'm bringing agents into the mix in just a second. So the buyer presents the offer to the seller. The buyer's the offer or the seller's the offeree. The buyer is giving the offer to the seller. The seller looks the offer over and they have three choice, two choices. The seller can accept it, reject it, or counter it. In our scenario down here, this seller has countered it. They have countered it. They have thrown the ball back in the buyer's court. The buyer, when they made the offer to the seller, let me go back real quick. When they made the offer to the seller, the offer or is going to sign it before they present it to the offer. They're going to show that they're making a legitimate offer. As a matter of fact, it's so legitimate, I'm going to sign it. So we already have the offer or signature in this case. Now we have a counter offer, the roles reverse. The seller in this case has to sign it, throw it back to the buyer. The counter offer, the roles reverse. The buyer now has three choices. They can accept it, reject it, or counter it. If the buyer accepts it, then they sign it. Once that last offeree signs it, I should have everybody's signatures, right? Because if everybody signs it as we go, once that last offeree accepts it, the offer or has already signed it. Now the offeree signs it. So that's step one. Basically, what I'm telling you, step one is we got to get everybody's signatures, offer or an offeree. So in this case, the buyer signs it. And then they have to communicate to the seller that they have accepted. Communication of acceptance must cross the line and that's the second step so the first step is everybody signs second step is communication of acceptance crosses the line and the offer or is notified that their offer has been accepted we're going to obviously walk through some more scenarios with this what questions do i have right now Again, we'll talk about the different ways we can communicate acceptance as well in just a second. You said that in pre-licensing, acceptance means it's been signed. Does that mean it has been delivered? No. Acceptance means it's been signed. That's step one. Step two is to deliver or communicate acceptance. We'll worry about delivering a copy of it in just a second, Tom. I see what you're asking now. I'll, I'll worry about delivering a copy in just a second. What we're talking about right now is communicating acceptance. I can communicate acceptance today and not actually send you the document until tomorrow. It's not about delivering the instrument. It's about communicating acceptance. So when you get that call, you're driving down the road and you get that call and you hear, my guys have accepted, we're under contract. Obviously you can't send it right now, right? You know what I'm saying? You're driving down the road. And yes, it's important that we deliver the instrument, but delivering the instrument is not what puts us under contract. What puts us under contract is communication of acceptance. Uh, somebody's asking about married couples. Absolutely, we didn't want to do that. Anybody that is going to be on the deed, anybody that has to um, convey any grantors and their spouses that have to convey, anybody that's going to purchase and be on the deed and possibly their spouses are going to have to sign. Remember, we got everybody on board in our agency agreements, right? Everybody that's supposed to be at closing to make that day happen, they're all on board from day one in our agency agreements. So now we need to get absolutely all signatures. 
Can they sign at different times? Absolutely. Yep. Yep. You may be, are you talking about like joint Tennessee and Tennessee in common? That's them all being there at the same time signing the deed, right? So that's at the closing table. We're just putting you under contract right now. I hear you. You're ready to go to closing. You're a few steps ahead of me. So <laughs> we got to get you under contract first. <laughs> All right, so let's bring agents into this mix, into this communication mix. This is important. When it comes to communicating contract, offer, acceptance, communicating to the agent is just as good as communicating to the buyer or the seller. So back to our contract communication wall, now we have an agent communicating on behalf of the buyer and we have an agent communicating on behalf of the seller. And when it comes to contract formation, contract negotiations, anytime you communicate to the agent, it is just as good as communicating to their party that they're standing on the side of the communication wall with. So let's walk through our scenario again. Now, the buyer and the sellers have agents. Buyer walks in the front door. You're showing property this afternoon. Buyer walks in the front door and falls in love. Says, this is the one. Let's go write it up. So you go get your laptop, get your paperwork, however you want to handle it. And you start asking the buyer all the questions you need to fill in the blanks on the offer to purchase and contract. How much do you want to offer? When do you want to close? Do you want the home warranty? All the blanks that we are getting ready to look at. You're gonna help your buyer determine what they wanna put in the blanks. So you complete the offer for them based on this conversation. And then you have your buyer sign it. The buyer's agent presents the offer to the listing agent. The selling agent presents the offer to the listing agent. Listing agent calls their seller and says, hey, we got an offer. You have three choices. You can accept it, reject it, or counter it. Again, the seller decides to counter it. So they state their terms to the agent. Is it the purchase price we're countering? Is it the closing date? Listing agent calls buyer's agent. See how we're kind of bouncing back and forth here? Listing agent calls buyer's agent. But it says, we got a counter offer. This is the seller's counter. This is what they want. Buyer says, that's fine with me. I accept. We then get our buyer to sign. Step one, I have to have the last offeree's acceptance. When the buyer communicates with their agent, when the buyer calls their agent oops, and says, I accept, buyer to their agent, did communication of acceptance cross the line? The buyer calls their agent. Did communication cross the line? No, we're still all hanging out over here on this side of the communication wall, right? Then the buyer's agent calls the listing agent and says, my guys have accepted. Now did communication cross the line? Poof, we are under contract. What would the listing agent's very next step want to be? What is the very next thing that the listing agent would want to do? So you've received communication of acceptance. You're going to call somebody. I see you guys calling somebody. Who are you going to call? Don't you want to call your seller and tell them the good news? And now when you're calling the seller, you're not saying, are you sure this is? You are calling the seller saying, congratulations, we are under contract. So when you tell me, that your guys have accepted, when you tell me that your guys have signed, we're under contract. That's what we mean by when it comes to contract formation, we stand in place with our clients, of our clients. You guys, if you haven't already, when you start seeing some of these test questions, y'all, I'm not kidding. Some of these test questions on this topic, contract formation, look like they're this long. They're like half of the page. I highly recommend you guys draw the communication wall and, draw, and map it out because there's gonna be some counters. That ball is gonna bounce back and forth. 
And bottom line, at the end of all that, you need to know who's the last offeree that needs to accept it and who's the last offer or that needs communication of acceptance. So it's kind of like math, isn't it? Take that problem and put it in a visual, put it in an image so you can see that counter back, walk back and forth. So we know who has to communicate, who has to accept. Talking about different methods of acceptance, how we can communicate acceptance. It, guys, there's no wrong way to communicate acceptance as long as the parties agree. So we could do email, text, phone call, voicemail, snail mail, carrier pigeon, makes no difference. As long as the parties agree on that form of communication is acceptable method of communication. Um, there's more traditional methods of communication, like picking up the phone and saying, my guys have signed, uh, my guys have accepted. <laughs> you could fax if you remember what one of those things are. Um, you could stick it in snail mail. Obviously, the older way to do it. Your book talks about something. This is a side note. Your book on page 286 talks about the mailbox rule. The mailbox rule is one of the older rules we have. This is like from back in the day of the Pony Express. I mean, it's that old. And what the mailbox rule says is that once the signed contract has been placed in the mail, communication of acceptance has happened. It doesn't matter that the recipient isn't gonna receive it for three days or three weeks later, depending on where we are with mail. You guys with me? Once it's delivered to the mail, once it hits the inside of the, of the mailbox, and the mailbox rule only applies when we're creating a contract. It doesn't apply when we're negotiating an offer. It doesn't apply when we're terminating. The mailbox rule only applies when we're communicating I know it's old. I know it seems out of date. I'm, we don't use it that much, but don't we still have the post office? Don't we still have mailboxes? So could you have communication this way? Yeah, it's possible. That's why we have to talk about it. Some more traditional methods for communication and then bringing us into the century, we have our electronic means. You could email it, our e-signatures. Um, when it comes to electronic communication, Communication of acceptance has happened once it hits the recipient's inbox. Not when it's sent and not when it's opened, but when it hits the recipient's inbox, communication of acceptance has happened. Another reason why when you guys see these problems that look like they're this long, Another reason why I want you guys to draw it out, draw the communication line and walk it back and forth every time there's a counter offer and reverse the roles. Within that test question, it's gonna give you several different methods of communication. So it might say that the buyer's agent called the listing agent and left a voicemail, and then they followed it up with a text. And then later that afternoon, they actually emailed the document. We got three different forms of communication here, right? It's only the first form of communication that puts us under contract. So I need you guys, when you're looking at those problems, I need you to ask, when is the first time that communication crossed the line? Because that's what did it. So in this case, in this scenario, what put us under contract, that magic moment in time, is when the other agent left you a voicemail saying, my guys have accepted. That's when we're under contract. The text is a follow-up. And obviously, as we said, you do eventually have to deliver the document. If I'm in the car, I'll probably tell you, I'll send it to you as soon as I get home, right? But we do have to deliver it. But what we're talking about is contract formation, not delivery of the instruments, not delivery of the documents. So one agent calls the other, one agent texts the other, whatever. It's the first time that that contract, that, excuse me, that communication crosses the contract wall. Break those questions down. Have you guys seen, anybody looked ahead and seen those yet? You're gonna, 
they're going to overwhelm you. So break them down, draw the contract communication wall, walk it back and forth, who's the offer or who's the offeree. And then look really carefully for the first time that communication crosses the line. That is what puts us under contract. Congratulations. Everything else is just a follow up. Questions? So let's look at an example, different methods of communication. Uh, an owner offers to sell to a prospective buyer. The offer states that acceptance must be made by email message only. What's the only acceptable form of communication? Email, that's what the offer tells you, right? Instead, the prospective buyer leaves a phone message informing the seller's acceptance on the offer, but guess what? It's not officially been accepted because the terms, how you want to be communicated with has been stated. Uh, we actually have a page in our contract that asks, how do you want to be communicated with? So we'll see our notice page, spell that out for us. The parties can agree to any form of communication, but the parties have to agree to that. Not everybody has an email address, you guys. I had the pleasure of helping the sweetest couple uh, sell their townhome a couple years ago. And they were moving to Myrtle Beach to be with the grandkids. And I was sitting in their living room doing the listing paperwork. And I said something about an email address. And he said, I think I have one of those. And she said, no, do I really need one? And at that moment in time, I realized I had two choices. I either teach them how to use their email I drive to their house and get wet signatures every time I needed something signed. What route do you think I went? <laughs> I figured the grandkids could teach them how to use their email. That's what they're for, right? <laughs> so we did. <laughs> we went old school and did wet signatures. They were really pleasant, so it was nice to visit. Sometimes it turned into a visit. Page 286, we see termination of offer. Please note this says terminating an offer. We're not under contract. As we said, a rejection or a counter offer will terminate an offer. If the offeree fails to accept within a prescribed time limit, the offer or may choose to put an expiration date on their offer. The offer or may say, my offer is good until 5 p.m. on February 3rd. If the offeree doesn't accept by 5 p.m. on February 3rd, the offer has been terminated. It could also terminate on its own within a reasonable amount of time. Well, who determines what a reasonable amount of time is? Pretty much that's the offer or. This is important. The offeror is free to pull back, to take back their offer at any time prior to acceptance. So if the offeror feels that it's been in the offeree's court too long and they're tired of waiting, they are free to take back their offer, to terminate their offer at any time prior to acceptance even if they put an expiration date on it. Remember that offer I just gave you that expired on February 3rd at 5 p.m.? If I wake up tomorrow and decide I don't wanna do it, I can terminate it as long as it happens prior to acceptance. So if it's pulled back prior to acceptance, that'll terminate the offer. And then death of either party, if the offer or the offeree pass away, that will terminate the offer. This is interesting. Death is only an out for an offer. Once the parties are under contract, 
If either party passes away, their heirs are expected to carry through with the terms. The thinking here is that the deceased party's intentions were clear because we have a signed contract, don't we? And if the heirs can't or won't fulfill the terms of the contract, they suffer those consequences of breach. Both parties have consequences of breach. So death is only an out <laughs> for an offer. Once you're under contract, So we're going to go off book for just a second. So we're going to go off the book. And what we need to talk before we get into our offer to purchase and contract, um, as with our agency agreements, the offer to purchase and contract comes with guidelines for completing. And there's a couple of things specifically that the guidelines say that we need to make sure that we do anytime we're completing an offer to purchase and contract, specifically standard form 2T, on behalf of our buyers or sellers. Um, one of the guidelines say that we need to type when at all possible. If you have to hand write an offer, pen only. Don't do it in pencil, don't do it in purple crayon. If you have to hand write it, do so legibly and pen only. We're instructed to fill in all of the blank spaces. Don't leave a blank blank. Leaving a blank blank could cause one of two things to happen. It might make the other side wonder if you left that blank on purpose or not, if you meant to put something in there. The other thing that leaving a blank blank can do is allow the other side to try to slip something in on be know it's to you or your party. So if you have a blank that's not applicable, you say N slash A, which means not applicable. Never leave a blank blank. Guidelines say we need to be precise. Um, we talked last night about not using our real estate lingo, our broker jargon. General public may not speak broker. So we need to make sure that our language is precise. Any change, addition or deletion needs to be initialed or signed acknowledged by all parties, all parties on both sides. And then we need to be reviewing the provisions of the contract with the parties. We need to be familiar with the contract so that we can have conversations with buyers and sellers. Guys, I'm here to tell you right now, buyers and sellers are not reading these things for the most part before they sign them. They're not, why? because they have an agent that they trust. They have an agent that they're relying on to get them through this transaction. Very few times will you come across, we call them readers. <laughs> so very few, few times will you come across a reader, but for the most part, they're not reading this. Blows my mind. I will send a buyer a, an offer with some addenda and a couple other things to sign. And I'll say, you know, look this over and let me know if you have any questions before you sign. And a minute and a half later, I have a signed contract sitting in my inbox. You telling me they read that thing in a minute and a half? There's no way, there's no way. Again, you do have some readers, absolutely. But for the most part, it's our responsibility to make sure that they understand the provisions of the contract. So at that point, it is communications has not been sent across the line. If you clarify back to the, your, uh, you know, buyer, seller, whoever you're representing, and they change their mind, is there an option to unsign, to counter, reject, whatever at that point? I guess I'm not following that question. Well, you just said that they, you sent them an email or sent them the contract through DocuSign, whatever. Mm -hmm. Minute and a half later, it comes back and it's been signed. You know they haven't read it. Mm -hmm. you it hasn't been communicated to the other party yet that it's been signed can you 
discuss with your principal and say, hey, the, not, let's discuss this, or is it done at that point? No, because we don't, if we haven't communicated, then we don't have a contract. It doesn't become a contract until we communicate that acceptance. So just because they sign, and I see that they sign, and that might be a good point for me to call them and say, are you good with what you signed? But remember, Tom, we're discussing what we're putting in the blanks before I ask them to sign it. And that's what we're saying here, reviewing the contract provisions. I'm having conversations with my buyers and sellers about the terms, about the different provisions, hopefully, before I'm ever asking them to sign it. So it shouldn't be anything new because we should have already reviewed those provisions with them. In other words, we're not just gonna send it to them and say, sign here, you'll be fine. Guys, please always remember, we are creating a legally binding contract for these parties. So don't they have a right to know what's going on? So ideally we're doing it up front, but yeah, if they sign and have questions, you're not under contract until you communicate that acceptance. Continuing to stay off book for just a bit, we're going to introduce you guys to some terms and some ideas when we meet our contract in a minute, but I found that it goes a little easier if we discuss some things before we start looking at the contract. So this is kind of our pre-contract discussion, if you will. And we're going to learn about something called a due diligence fee. We're going to learn about something called a due diligence period. And we're going to learn about something called an earnest money deposit. So before we see these in our contract, I want to make sure that we have a conversation about them first. So when we do see them in the contract, they tend to make a little bit more sense. Please remember the due diligence fee, the due diligence period, and the earnest money deposit. This discussion is as it relates to standard form 2T. If you're using another contract, it may or may not have due diligence. It may or may not have earnest money. So this is specific to standard form 2T, which is the contract we will look at in just a bit. So let's break these down and talk about what each of these are and each of these do. First off, in R2T vernacular, we're talking about a deposit and we're talking about a fee. And generally speaking, a fee is non-refundable a deposit, maybe. So we talked about the earnest money deposit. Is that refundable? Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. We mentioned the due diligence fee. Is it refundable? Refundable? Generally, no. So that's what we're saying here. Deposits usually are refundable, maybe refundable. Deposits are not. So let's talk first about our due diligence fee. The due diligence fee is a negotiated amount that the buyer pays to the seller when we go under contract. So we negotiate the amount of the due diligence fee. There is no formula. There is no set amount. I can't tell you guys for every 100000 you do this, that. It's a completely negotiable amount. The Real Estate Commission is very helpful with our due diligence fee and our earnest money deposit. Y'all want to know what they tell us? Those amounts or whatever the buyer is willing to offer and the seller is willing to accept. Gee, thanks. It could be 50 cents. It could be $50,000. Completely negotiable. When we, when that offer gets accepted and we go under contract, the buyer is going to pay the seller. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Does that sound crazy? The buyer is going to give the seller money. Why in the world is the buyer going to do that? What the buyer is paying the seller for is the right to terminate. The buyer will have a due diligence period, negotiated amount of time. And the due diligence period is the buyer's opportunity to learn as much about the home as they possibly can and decide in their sole discretion, do I want to move forward with this contract 
or do I want to terminate? And the contract says that the due diligence fee is the buyer's right to terminate for any reason or no reason at all. It is their right to terminate. If the buyer terminates, well, that's on the next slide. I got ahead of myself. The due diligence fee is almost always going to be non-refundable. Remember, we just said a fee is not refundable. So the buyer pays for their right to terminate. If they do terminate, they are not getting their due diligence fee back because that's what they paid for. Guys, the seller can't sue the buyer. The seller accepted money in exchange for allowing the buyer an opportunity to get out of this contract. Do you remember caveat mTOR? What's caveat mTOR say? Buyer beware. Who's the onus on to learn about this property? The buyer. Does the seller have to disclose anything? No. Does that seem fair to the buyer? Not even a little bit, does it? So what's the answer to caveat mTOR? Let's give this buyer a free look, period, if you will. Let's give them an opportunity, a window to decide. I've had the home inspection. I've had the appraisal, pest inspection, et cetera. Give them an opportunity to decide if they want to move forward with or terminate this transaction. The only time, well, there's two times that the buyer may, and I'm stressing the word may, there's only two times that the buyer may get their due diligence back. And that's if the seller breaches or if the property's destroyed. A uh, question comes in, can you still get a due diligence period if you don't pay a fee? Absolutely, whatever the buyer's willing to offer and the seller's willing to accept. So if the buyer offers zero and the seller accepts zero, we have formed a contract with how much due diligence the seller getting? Zero. So the amount of due diligence is negotiable. The period of time is all negotiable. It's all negotiable. So the buyer terminates, do they get their due diligence feedback? The answer is no. Why? Because if they terminate, they've exercised their right to terminate. That's what they paid the seller for, was the right to terminate. There's a very common misconception out there with the due diligence fee, that the buyer's paying the seller to take their home off the market and not allow any more showings. Not true, the seller can still have showings. The seller could still accept a backup offer. The buyer's paying the seller for that right to terminate. Again, the seller can't take the buyer to court if they terminate within this time. You said there's two conditions in which DDF is refundable. One is a property destroyed. What was the other one? Seller breach. So that's one amount of money that changes hands when we go under contract, the due diligence fee. It goes from the buyer to the seller. The other amount of money that changes hands generally when we go under contract is the earnest money deposit. Once again, a negotiable amount. The whole point of the earnest money deposit is to show the seller the buyer's good faith. The seller wants to know that this is a serious buyer. The seller wants to know that this buyer just isn't out here kicking tires. So how can the buyer prove to the seller that they're serious? Doesn't money talk? Money talks. And in our contract world, the language that we're speaking is that of an earnest money deposit. The earnest money deposit is known as good faith money. The earnest money deposit goes into an escrow account or a trust account. It's an impartial third party. The buyer doesn't keep it. The seller doesn't get it. So it goes into an escrow account, also known as a trust account. Both we are talking about license law and commission rule. 
You guys will read about those before we get there in your comments. Again, the buyer's just proven to the seller that they're serious. I'm legitimately interested in your home. Think about it. Doesn't the seller have to find somewhere else to live? Don't they have to make arrangements to go somewhere? They got to move. Before you start going under contract for another house or signing a year lease, don't you want to know that this is legit? And that's what the earnest money is showing the seller. So now the question becomes, uh, let's see, does the firm create the escrow account? Good question. Either the real estate firm can have an escrow account or we can let our closing attorney handle it, which is what a lot of firms are doing these days. Because So now the question is, the buyer's put down, they've cut two checks, right? We went under contract. I need two checks, one directly to the seller, the other one to the escrow agent. If the buyer terminates, the question is, so will the buyer get their earnest money deposit back? We already know they're not getting due diligence back. So now the question is, if the buyer terminates, will they get their earnest money deposit back? And the answer to that is, it depends. If the buyer terminates within due diligence, they are not considered in breach. If they terminate while we are still in due diligence, they are not in breach. They're not considered in breach until after our due diligence period. Why? Because that's the buyer's opportunity to terminate, their right to terminate for any reason or no reason. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so say that I was a buyer and I'm buying your home, but I don't want to pay the due diligence fee, but I will give you some earnest money. So anything's negotiable. Anything's negotiable. So I wouldn't have a period, right? You, the oh. amount and the time are two different things. Okay. So you could ask for time without any money. Oh, okay. I don't know how okay. sellers can respond to that. that. I'll be very honest with you, Tiffany. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> be, no, I'm just being honest. I don't know how a seller will respond to that, but you can offer whatever. Anything is negotiable. Okay. I, I think understand. I'm. Oh, I'm sorry. So I'm I just not understanding what due diligence money is. Yeah. You're saying you cut two checks. Um, I thought that you, you know, in order to take it off the market, you go ahead and you give them some money and that um, they decide whether they want to buy your house or not. Where, where's the fee come in? What, I don't get it. The fee goes from the buyer to the seller for that right to terminate. The buyer's paying the seller directly for that right to terminate. But you're you're saying they get two things. One is a fee and one is a deposit. So the second um, a due one is the earnest money deposit that sits in an escrow account that shows the seller the buyer's good faith. Okay, so what's a due diligence fee? What is that? The right to terminate, the buyer's right to terminate. That's what they're paying for. The seller can't take the buyer to court if they terminate. And that's what I'm trying to say right here because the buyer's not in breach if they terminate within due diligence. That's what they pay for. I got a question, but while I'm in due diligence, I'm the buyer, you said that they can take a backup offer. I'm, I'm trying to get there, yep. So, so let's first understand when the buyer's in breach, okay? Buyer's not in breach until after due diligence. So if the buyer terminates within their due diligence period, they will get their earnest money deposit back. So we go under contract, they cut one check to the seller for the due diligence fee, they cut a different check to the escrow agent for an earnest money deposit. We're still in due diligence and the buyer exercises their right to terminate. The seller's gonna keep the due diligence fee because that's what the buyer paid for. But as long as we're still in due diligence, the buyer's gonna get their earnest money back. Remember last night we defined something called time is of the essence. Our due diligence period is a drop dead date and time. The contract, when we see it, is going to say due diligence is good through February 2nd at 5 p.m. And the buyer has until February 2nd at 5 p.m. to terminate. 
or March 2nd or June 2nd, whatever we agree to. And if the buyer terminates for any reason within the due diligence period, the seller will keep the due diligence fee. If the buyer terminates after due diligence at 501 on our due diligence date, now the buyer is in breach. The seller will still keep the due diligence fee, but now as a consequence of that breach, the seller's also going to get the earnest money deposit. So if the buyer terminates, do they get their earnest money deposit back? And again, the answer to that is it depends. If we terminate within due diligence, yes. After due diligence, no. So DDP and DT, whatever, both of them are the, are the same? Because I'm not due, understanding the difference. <laughs> due diligence fee? Yeah, because they're both getting their period. Money back. Hmm? They're both getting their money back. I thought like the fee was not Who, different. Who's both? Yeah. Who's who's getting their money back? The buyers, because I'm reading my notes and they're saying the buyer's right to terminate and they get their money back. No, ma'am. They do not get the due diligence fee back. They get the earnest money deposit back. The seller's going to keep the due diligence fee. Okay, guys, you know what? Let's do this. We're going to take a break. We need a break. So let's take 10. We come back. We're going to start this little discussion over again. So let's take 10. Uh, we come back and, and we're going to read all about this in the contract too. So please, please bear with me. Uh, just bear with me. So let's take 10. And we'll, we'll, we'll have this conversation again, make sure we're all on the same page.
all the way back. All right, so we're going to take attendance. We're going to have this, we need to make sure we're all good. So we're going to have this discussion again. We're going to see this again when we look at our contract in just a few minutes. You guys are going to see it again when you study it. I get some of these terms are kind of tricky, which is why we're going through them a couple times in class. Uh, you guys will go through them as well. So we're introducing you to new concepts. Um, and they're kind of strange, aren't they? So I just took attendance. So what we're going to do is go back and make sure um, have this little conversation again and make sure that we're all good. So we're talking about three different things. Yeah. I was going to say, is greasing the palms not an appropriate term for the DDF? Absolutely not. So we're going to talk about three different things. We're talking about the due diligence fee, also known as the DDF. We're talking about the due diligence period, also known as the DDP. And we're also talking about the earnest money deposit, also known as the EMD. These are only three different points of the contract, but they're the ones that tend to cause the most confusion, which is why I wanted to pull them out and talk about them ahead of time before we actually before we actually see them in the contract. So due diligence fee, due diligence period, and then the earnest money deposit are all negotiable. There is no set amount. There is no set date. All three of these things are negotiable between the parties. Uh, we just briefly said that a deposit is generally refundable, while a fee is not. I think that's a big step in helping us understand the due diligence fee and the earnest money deposit. Just based on what we know so far, is the buyer going to get their fee back? Are they going to get their due diligence fee back? It's really rare, right? Because fees are generally non-refundable. Can they get their earnest money back? Well, it depends. It depends. So the due diligence fee is a negotiable amount that the buyer pays directly to the seller. So we go under contract and the buyer produces a check, cashier's check, money order, whatever, to the seller for the amount of the negotiated due diligence fee. And what the buyer is paying the seller for is their right to terminate. That's what the due diligence fee is for. The buyer has a period of time to terminate. And the contract specifically says for any reason or no reason. They could have a home inspection report and find a whole bunch of things wrong with the property and say, I don't want to deal with this. They literally could wake up tomorrow and say, nah, I don't want to buy this house. The due diligence fee is paid directly from the buyer to the seller for their right to terminate. If the buyer terminates within due diligence or even after, they're not going to get that fee back. Remember, we just said fees are non-refundable. So if the buyer ever terminates, either inside or outside of due diligence, this, that's the sellers to keep. The buyer prepaid for that right, if we will. If they terminate within due diligence, they've exercised their right to terminate. Again, the contract says they have that right to terminate for any reason or no reason. So the fee is money to the seller for the buyer's right to terminate. The other check, the other monies that the buyer has to deliver when we go under contract. There's two, I say checks, but there's two monies that the buyer has to give when we go under contract. One goes directly to the seller, which is the due diligence fee. The other money is the earnest money deposit. The buyer is putting that money into an escrow account or a trust account. It's either with the real estate firm or with the closing attorney. It's a third party that's holding the money. They're safeguarding it on behalf of the parties. Guys, please understand, buyers and sellers don't know each other. If you don't know somebody, are you going to hand them a check for $5,000 and trust that they will take care of it? 
absolutely not. So the escrow agent is like this third impartial party. They are going to hold the earnest money deposit until we either close or we terminate. So it hangs out in any escrow account during the contract to closing process. It's going to depend if the buyer gets their earnest money back. And the reason for that is because remember, the earnest money is showing the buyer's good faith. If they terminate within due diligence, the buyer's going to get the earnest money back because they're not in breach while they're in due diligence. They've negotiated this time. This is the solution to caveat mTOR. Learn as much about the property as you possibly can. So the buyer's not considered in breach during due diligence because the due diligence period is their right to terminate. That's what they paid for. No reason or any reason. The seller's always going to keep the due diligence fee. If the buyer terminates, the seller's going to keep it. If the buyer terminates, the seller's going to keep it. I don't care if it in due diligence, outside of due diligence, the seller's going to keep the due diligence fee. If the buyer terminates within due diligence, they get their earnest money back. If they terminate after due diligence, then the earnest money goes to the seller. Because if it's after due diligence, now the buyer has breached the contract. And there's consequences to breach. So they have, again, that due diligence period is kind of like their free look period, right? You have this opportunity. If they terminate, yes, they're going to be out the due diligence fee. They're going to be out the cost of any inspections, but it's going to save them from buying a money pit, right? So the buyers had all their inspections and investigations, and they learned there's a whole lot of things wrong. And within the next year, they got to put on a new roof and redo the electrical and fix the structural. And they have all these problems with the home. They may choose to terminate kind of that they've learned about it. It could be cheaper for them to terminate and lose that due diligence fee than it is to buy the house and deal with all those problems. Remember last night we talked about um, uh, money damages and we talked about compensatory and consequential money damages. And we mentioned something about liquidated damages. Liquidated damages are monies that the parties agree to at contract formation. And in our contract, the buyer's consequences of breach is that they lose, seller will keep the due diligence, they lose the earnest money. And those two amounts are the seller's liquidated damages. This is what they get if the buyer terminates after due diligence. So if the buyer breach, remember it's after due diligence, the seller will keep the due diligence fee, the seller will get the earnest money deposit, and the contract also says that the due diligence fee and the earnest money deposit are the seller's um, sole and exclusive remedy for the buyer breach. So as listing agents, we need to make sure that the seller is good with these amounts because if the buyer breaches, if the buyer never shows up to closing or they terminate that day, this is all the seller gets. Remember, the seller's got to find somewhere else to live, don't they? We either got to buy a new house or sign a lease or something. And that's the question, listing agents. If your buyer never shows up for closing, never buys this house, are you comfortable with this amount? There are some common, Tom, to your question earlier. There are some people out there that cannot stand the due diligence. It's the sellers taking advantage. Guys, every market's different. This market we're coming out of, yeah, we were seeing due diligence fees of $50,000, $75,000. I've heard of some six-digit due diligence fees. 10 years ago, due diligence fee was $250, $300. It's all negotiable and you're gonna see it's who's driving this market, who's in the driver's seat. If it's the sellers, are they jacking up the due diligence? Well, yeah, because it's competitive. 
you got 12 offers coming in. What's one way you can make your offer stand out? Offer more due diligence, offer more earnest money. If the buyers are driving, they're in control. It's why it's all negotiable. So what is the seller this. get? I'm sorry. All right, so you may get to this, but are both the DDF and the EMD applying to the towards the purchase price? Absolutely. And yes, we are getting there. Yep. So if we go to closing, no more of this doom and gloom, right? If we go to closing, it's not wasted money. And yes, we are getting there. So in the event of the buyer breach, what are the buyer's consequences for breaching this contract? The seller gets the fee, the seller gets the deposit. If the seller breaches, now the buyer can sue. Remember last night we talked about compensatory damages. We talked about specific performance. The remedies, the consequences I should say for seller breach are much harsher than for buyer breach. And the reason being is because the seller is the one that initiated this whole thing to begin with by putting a for sale sign in their yard. The seller was the whole one that started this chain of events. And if later in the contract, the seller decides they don't wanna go through with it, they're gonna have bigger consequences because they started it. Julie? Yeah. Sure, you said the consequences of the buyer breach is the seller gets the fee and the deposit, I get a deposit back if I'm the buyer, right? If you terminate within your due the, diligence period. Period, thank you, that makes sense. Your buyer's not in breach while you're in that due diligence period. So when we talk about buyer breach, it is after due diligence. Yep, yep. Good point, thank yep. you. Uh-huh. You do so, agency fees, you mentioned in uh, buyer breach that what the seller gets the money, but you didn't discuss the agency fees. Well, we did. When we talked about the agency pre licensing. Agreement? Who's the agency agreement between the client and who? And the principal. The, the client is the principal. So the agency well, agreement is between the principal and who? Well, and the uh, the firm. Yes. So yes. if the buyer breaches or the seller breaches, we've earned our commission. Remember the difference in when we earn our commission versus when we actually get paid. I earn my commission when I connect the two, when I get them under contract, when I introduce the two together. I don't actually get paid until it closes. So the question is, if either party breaches, can I still get paid? Well, the, the agency agreement says we've earned our commission. Now it's up to the firm if they want to go after the breaching party. It's up to the firm if they want to go collect to court and collect the commission. No more doom and gloom. What happens if we actually go to closing? Sometimes these things do close. Sometimes they terminate, but sometimes they close. If we actually make it to closing, the due diligence fee and the earnest money deposit are going to be credited back to the buyer. If we make it to closing, these things are kind of like down payments. So if you put down... 50,000 in due diligence and 50,000 in earnest money, is there risk to buying a house? Well, of course there is. Of course there is. There's no sure guarantee. If we make it to closing, both of those amounts are going to be credited back that that much less money that the buyer has to bring to closing. Again, when we get to unit 21, we're going to break down debits and credits. And we're going to talk again about what happens to the due diligence fee and the earnest money if we make it to closing. And they'll be credited back to the buyer. The due diligence fee is going to be a debit from the seller. They've already received it once. Didn't they receive a check when we went under contract? So now that we make it to closing, we got to reverse that. So we're going to see two credits to the buyer and a debit to the seller. So you mentioned that the um, EMD was put in escrow for them. 
but the uh, due diligence was is supposed to be to Mr. Jones, the guy selling the house, mm -hmm. that check. So who holds that check? Oh, the seller deposit is the seller's money. They're going to deposit it as soon as they as soon as they get it in their hot little hand. They want to go to a fancy dinner tonight. You want to use it towards requested repairs. That becomes a seller's money. The buyer is paying the seller directly. Well, are you talking about during the due diligence period? Who holds it? Because if you if I guess the question is if you can't if a buyer cancels during the due diligence period, and they're going to get that DD. Uh, due diligence feedback it's not literally the same check they don't get it back the it, seller it, keeps the due diligence fee oh i'm sorry i'm sorry you're right the seller keeps it because that is what the buyer paid for what's the buyer paying for the right to terminate so when they terminate they're exercising their right to terminate there's no point in paying the seller and then say, I'm going to terminate. Give me my money back. What did the seller gain from that? Guys, there's two parties we got to think about here, aren't they? And we got to consider with the seller, due diligence and earnest money is all you get. For the buyer, you have a little looky-loo period, if you will. You have an opportunity to get some of that earnest money back. So they keep the, you're not going to get the feedback, but the buyer would get their earnest money back if they close. If they, they get it credited back and they will get their earnest money back if they terminate within the due diligence period. Got you. After due diligence, now they're in breach and they will lose the earnest money. So what we're going to do now, we're going to do a deep dive in our standard form 2T. Um, there's a conversation in your book from page 287 to 293. All those are specifics to what we're getting ready to look at. We're going to see due diligence defined. We're going to see earnest money defined. You have a conversation about both of those in your book on 289 and 290. So we're going to, again, what we just did was your first introduction to it. We're going to see it again. You guys are going to study it again this weekend. So if we look in our online learning system and up here under the welcome section are our forms tab. And if we click on this link, we have access to every single form that ever was. And we're not going through all these in class. We're just going through actually the three, the two agency agreements and our offer to purchase and contract. So if we pull this up, I thought it was already here. Hang on just one second. So this is our standard form 2T, offer to purchase and contract. Uh, it does come with guidelines. Any, like we said, any major form from NCAR is going to have come with guidelines on how to complete. So if you're ever stuck on what goes in a blank, if you're ever stuck what to fill in, you can always refer to the guidelines. They will help. If you guys don't read anything else on this contract, I want you to pay attention. I'd like you to look through the whole thing. But I want you to pay attention to this first provision, which is terms and definitions. The first two and a half pages of this contract are just defining things, defining due diligence, defining earnest money, defining the various terms of the contract. So I think the first provision is the most important. So the first thing we're gonna define is the parties to the contract. And there are two parties. We have the full legal names of all of the sellers that have to sign to convey and the full legal names of all the buyers that plan to purchase. So do we find the parties to the contract? 
Then we define the property. Um, here's our street address, city, zip, county. Where's the property located? And then we need our legal description. How much of our legal description uh, can we find, can we have? So we're like, is it a subdivision? What's the deed book and page, tax, pen ID? We saw something very similar when we looked at our listing agreement with plugging in the, the property address and the legal description. And guys, please remember what we said. Let's go way back in time for a minute, back to unit four. And we were talking about legal descriptions and we made comment about an informal reference. An informal reference is the street address. And the street address, when you are conveying property, the street address alone is not sufficient. This is a contract to convey property. So while the street address is important, it's not enough. We need as much as the legal description is what we, what we can, what we have. Then we have to define our purchase price. You guys see all these blanks? All these blanks are completely negotiable. How much are you gonna pay? It's negotiable. So we have our purchase price. Uh, we are told we have an amount for the due diligence fee that's made payable and delivered to the seller by the effective date and the means that we're gonna deliver it. So whatever amount we agree to, is it 500, is it 50,000? Whatever amount we agree to, it's gonna go on this line. We have earnest money made payable and delivered to the escrow agent. Again, in what form? Personal check. So whatever amount we agree to, again, goes on this line. Um, you may come across additional earnest money. Earnest money is earnest money is earnest money. Either you're paying it up front or you're paying it later in the contract. That's the difference in initial and additional. All negotiable, how we want to handle that. The rest of these lines, I'll let you guys, if we're going to do a loan assumption, which we'll talk a little bit about in um, our financing units, if the seller is going to do seller financing, if it's new construction, we may have a building deposit. But I will kind of get back to these later. I'll let you guys look at these. And then this bottom line is the balance. So if we are writing this up, and your buyer wants to offer a purchase price of $100,000 and they want 5,000 in due diligence and they wanna do, I'm just making numbers up, 1,500 in earnest money. What this portion of the form is telling us, and of course I did numbers that I have to get a calculator, hang on. The top line minus all the lines in between is going to serve as the balance of the purchase price that's due from the seller at settlement. So we agree to the purchase price. We agree to the due diligence. We agree to the earnest money. And then the very last line of this says, if we make it to closing, the buyer doesn't have to bring $100,000. Now they only have to bring 93,500 because they've prepaid, if you will, that deposit and that fee. So if we make it to closing, do they get that money back? Of course, this money's not gonna go away. Remember guys, any legally binding contract has to have teeth. It has to have something to hold the parties. And if you don't do what you promise to do, what's gonna be your consequences? And that's part of what we're negotiating here with the due diligence and the earnest money. Still on terms and definitions. Um, here is our earnest money deposit. Shall be deposited and promptly held in an escrow by an escrow agent until closing, at which time will be credited to the buyer or until this contract is otherwise terminated. Then we define who the escrow agent is, who is gonna hold the earnest money deposit. Like we said, sometimes it's the real estate firm. 
A lot of real estate firms are starting to do away with trust accounts because there's really big liabilities. Our closing attorneys have to have an escrow account anyway. So since they have to do one anyway, why not let them hold it? But who is going to hold the earnest money is negotiable. We define the effective date. Remember that magic moment in time when it goes from being an offer to a contract? Our contract calls that the effective date. And our contract says it's the date that the last one signs and such signing is communicating to the party making the offer. So we said we need two things to happen, that magic moment in time when it goes from being an offer to a contract. I got to get the last offeree to sign and then communication of acceptance has to cross the line. Then we define due diligence. Due diligence is the buyer's opportunity to investigate the property, um, including but not limited to matters below. So the buyer can decide in their sole discretion if they're gonna proceed with or terminate the transaction. Due diligence is the buyer's opportunity to learn as much about the property as they possibly can and decide. Now knowing what I know, do I want to go ahead and buy this house or do I want to terminate? This is the answer to caveat emptor. Then we define the due diligence fee. We're told it's a negotiated amount paid by the buyer to the seller for the buyer's right to terminate for any reason or no reason during the due diligence period. It is the property of the seller upon the effective date and shall be a credit to the buyer at closing. It is non-refundable except in the event of the seller's breach or what paragraph 23B is addressing destruction of the property. So due diligence period is just before it goes under contract. No, due diligence period starts on the effective date and ends through 5 p.m. on whatever date we agree to. And that's our time being of the essence, the drop dead date and time. So due diligence starts when we go under contract. Due diligence goes through 5 p.m on whatever date we agree to. The fee is the negotiated amount, the buyer pays the seller, and they're paying for that right to terminate. What questions do we have? By the way, I don't know if you guys have seen this, but our offer to purchase and contract is now up to 16 pages. 16 pages. That's a lot, isn't it? Basically, 16 pages for the buyer to promise to buy and the seller to promise to sell. That's the gist of it. So our due diligence. Our due diligence fee and our due diligence period are all defined here. Again, the parties agreed to a date. Um, buyer's agents, you want to make sure that you have a long enough due diligence for your buyer to do the home inspection, for the buyer to have the appraisal done. We want to make sure that there's time. And again, it could depend on the market. If we're slammed, so are the home inspectors. 
So it could depend on the market. It could depend on how busy, how swiftly things are moving. But bottom line is it's all negotiable. Could be a day, could be a month, could be eight months. It's all negotiable. Eight months. Still defining things, top of page three. We talk about something called settlement and settlement date. And then we talk about something called closing. I'm getting ready to blow y'all's mind. We all talk about, anybody ever bought or sold a house? Where are the people that bought or sold? And you guys were told at some point during that transaction that we're gonna go to closing on this date. And you went to the attorney's office and you signed or did whatever you had to do, yes? The truth is not a single one of, this, of us on this call, including myself, have ever been to closing. What we attend, what we go to with our buyers and sellers so they can sign their paperwork is settlement. We all call it closing. You will too, once you get your license, you'll tell your buyers we got closing on this day. But what we actually attend is settlement. This is when the closing attorney is receiving all documents necessary to complete the transaction and they're receiving any necessary funds to complete the transaction. So settlement is when the buyer goes and they bring their money, the, the buyer goes to sign their paperwork. If the seller has to take any money, bring any money to the table, they do theirs, they sign their paperwork. We have to agree on a settlement date. What date are we all gonna go to the closing attorney's office to sign? It's Obviously, after due diligence, again, it's all negotiable. So is it a week after due diligence? Is it a couple weeks? Once we leave the attorney's office, once we all leave settlement, then the attorney proceeds with closing. And closing is defined as the completion of the legal process in which transfer of the title from the seller to the buyer. And closing consists of the following steps. Closing does consist of settlement, uh, the completion of a satisfactory title update, the closing attorney's receipt of the lender's monies, if any, and then the very last act, the very last thing that happens once all of the above are satisfied, is that the attorney records the buyer's brand new deed at the register of deeds. And then, and only then, is it a done deal. So the very last thing to happen, what solidifies this closing, is the buyer's brand new deed gets recorded at the, at the courthouse. You and I, are not gonna get paid until it closes. If the seller's expecting money net to seller, they're not getting anything until it closes. Keys shouldn't be given to the buyer until it closes because it's not the buyer's property until that very last step, until that deed is recorded down at the courthouse. So we all go to settlement. We call it closing, but we go to settlement. Again, when you get out in the real world, you'll call it closing too. I need you guys to be in pre-licensing world right now because you could be asked about settlement. You could be asked about closing. So we need to make sure that we're speaking the proper verbiage for our exam. Questions? So there's two amounts, well, three amounts, purchase price, due diligence fee, earnest money. There's two dates that have to be negotiated. We have a due diligence date, and then we have a settlement date.
Uh, then we define special assessments. We've talked about special assessments, could be a charge from the government, could be a charge from the HOA. Right now, we're just defining what a special assessment is. Um, we'll actually break down in just a bit who's responsible for what and when. So we'll break down each party's responsibilities. Again, you guys, the first two and a half pages are terms and definitions. And it's important that we know what these things are, not just for your test, because remember, we're the ones explaining this to the buyers and the sellers. We're the ones explaining to the seller, if the buyer never shows up on closing day, this due diligence and earnest money is it. That's all you get. We're explaining to the buyer, if you put down a big healthy due diligence deposit and you decide not to buy, you exercise your right, that's your right, but you're not getting that money back. So I think it was Tiffany early brought up the fact, could I put down zero due diligence and go in heavy on earnest money? Whatever the buyer's willing to offer and the seller is willing to accept. Then we talk about fixtures, uh, various things about fixtures. We've seen this list. We saw this very list in our listing agreement. Remember when we were getting into the listing agreement with the seller, we had to have a conversation about fixtures. Are you gonna take any of these with you? If you are, let's discuss them now. Very list shows up in the offer to purchase and contract. There is a place if any fixtures are going to go, then we would make sure that those fixtures that do not convey go here. So if the seller hasn't taken them down prior to listing, if the buyer has seen it, then we need to make sure it's excluded. The buyer deserves to know that when they buy this house, that fixture is not gonna be there. So we're having a conversation with fixtures again, buyers and sellers. And then we also talk about personal property. Always remember this, fixtures are meant to stay. Personal property is meant to go, right? Remember unit two, fixtures are meant to stay. Personal property is meant to go. If they're going to do the opposite of their intent, they need to be in the contract. So if fixture is going to go and a personal property is going to stay, that's what we need to put in the contract. And when you guys are filling in fixtures that go and personal property that stays, I need you to be specific. Don't just put refrigerator in here, for example, because that's the number one negotiated thing. Don't just put that the fridge is a personal property that's going to stay. There have been stories, I've not had personal experience, but there have been stories after closing, you put fridge in there and after closing, the buyer shows up with their keys to their brand new house and they walk in the kitchen and where the big refrigerator should be in its place is a two shelf dorm room refrigerator. Did the seller do what they were contractually obligated to do? Did they leave a fridge? Yeah, is that what the buyer envisioned? Probably not. So when you guys are filling this out, you need to be specific. Two door stainless steel Whirlpool refrigerator. Sometimes when you open the doors, you can get like a model number inside. Be specific, make sure we're very clear about which fridge. Some people have like a, like a, um, a drink fridge in the garage. If that's not what your buyers are referring to, make sure we're specific on the fridge. Don't be a story in a pre-licensing class. So fixtures, personal property. And then we get to provision four. Provisions four, five, and six are all about the buyer. So if you're working with the buyer, we can like kind of point them to provisions four, five, and six. And this first one, provision four, is talking about the buyer's due diligence process. And it starts with a big red warning. Buyers strongly encouraged to conduct due diligence during the due diligence period. 
If the buyer's not satisfied with the results of their due diligence, buyers should terminate this contract prior to the expiration of the due diligence period, unless they can get an extension from the seller. But please note, the seller is not obligated to grant an extension. So if your buyer thinks you want more time, we can always ask, but the seller's under no obligation to grant that, ex that extension. So if we get, again, you guys, if we get a really bad home inspection report and it's just a laundry list of things that are wrong, by the way, let's just go ahead and get this out there right now. There's no such thing as a perfect home. All homes have problems. The home inspector's job is to go in and point out all the problems. The home inspector is not going to tell the buyer they're buying a lovely home. The home inspector's job is to go in and say, this is broke, that's not working, da da da. The home inspection report kind of be doom and gloom, right? Nothing in this house worked, does it? So there's going to be problems. How many? That's, or what is the buyer willing to tolerate? That's what they're deciding. That's why they're doing all these inspections and investigations. They're trying to learn about the home so they can decide if they want to deal with those problems or not. Uh, other things that the buyer should do during their due diligence, we want to get them approved for their loan. Now, before we take them out and show them property, we're going to have them talk to a lender. We're going to get them pre-approved or pre-qualified, but a pre-approval and a pre-qualification are no guarantee. We still have to go through the loan process, which generally starts when we go under contract. We're going to talk about the loan process as we get into our financing units. Remember we defined that contingency last night. There is no loan or appraisal contingency. Can the parties agree to add one? Yeah, but there is no contingency in here that says, if the buyer finds out they can't get loan approval, that's not a reason for them to terminate and get any monies back. There is no contingency there. And then during the due diligence, again, the big part of it is for the buyer to do their property investigation. So it just gives them a list of things to consider while they're trying to learn all about this property that they possibly can't, talking about their inspections, reviewing of documents. If they're in an HOA, we wanna help them get those covenants so they can make sure they're good with those. Um, here's our seller disclosures, a residential property and owner association disclosure statement. So helping them gather and review the documents, homeowner's insurance, uh, that's unit 13. We'll talk about that. The appraisal survey back to unit four. Here's our zoning. Is it in a flood hazard? What are the utilities? Streets or roads? Is it private or public? And then any special assessments coming down on page six. No, it ends here. This is what we need to know. This list of the things that the buyer should be encouraged to investigate during their due diligence period, this list is not inclusive. This is just helping the buyer figure out what to do. This is helping point them in the right direction. Guys, always remember, if it's important to my buyer, then it's important to me. So if there's something that my buyer wants to inspect or investigate that's not on this list, my answer is, okie doke, let's do it. Because they are the one that's responsible for learning about the property. And when they hire me, I take on that responsibility with them. So don't you ever look at a buyer and say, well, it's not on the list, so you don't need to worry about it. If it's important to them, then it's important to me. So this just gives them an idea of where to start. Um, repair improvements, buyer acknowledges and understands unless the parties agree otherwise. Here it is. This property is being sold in its current condition. 
poems are as is. The seller's not under any obligation to do repairs. They can enter into negotiations for repairs, but they're under no obligation. The buyers need to ask, if they're gonna ask for repairs, they need to do so while we are still in due diligence. Because if the buyer asks for repairs and the seller says no, which is their right, if the seller says no, the buyer has that decision to make. Now knowing what I know, do I want to move forward with or terminate this transaction? So we find this whole laundry list of things that are wrong. Buyer asks the seller. Seller says, no, I'm not doing anything. The buyer's got to consider, do I want to buy this house with all these problems that I learned about? Or do I want to terminate and walk away, cut my losses? I have a highlighted one for you guys somewhere. I'll get that, put it in Learn Test Pass. Because again, there's stuff talked about in the syllabus. I don't know what happened to my highlighted one though, but I'll get it for you guys. So we're just kind of pulling out. Uh, buyer's right to terminate, provided that the buyer has delivered the fee, any agreed upon fee. The buyer shall have the right to terminate this contract for any reason or no reason. All they have to do is deliver written notice of termination during the due diligence period. And there's our time being of the essence. If the buyer timely delivers, this contract shall be terminated and the earnest money shall be refunded to the buyer. Again. Any reason or no reason. I keep giving the example of a really, really, really bad home inspection. Buyer says, my gosh, I don't want to deal with that. They can terminate. They could also terminate for no reason. Had an agent once. We leave, I'll leave you with this before we go to break. Had an agent once. Her buyer's terminated. Y'all want to know why? They like to grill out in the evening. And they realized that the sun set in the backyard. And they said, that's going to damper our evening plans. So they terminated. They exercised their right to terminate. Is that a reason? Well, to them it was. We may not think it was, but to them it was that important. They terminated. They got their earnest money deposit back. They downloaded a compass on their phone. So the next time they were looking at property, they could see where the sun set. They didn't have to go through that again. If it's important to them, then it's important to us. I've had buyers show up with compasses before because I want to know where the sun sets. The last piece of this under the buyer's due diligence, closing shall constitute accept of the acceptance of the property in its then existing condition, unless provisions otherwise are made in writing. Once we get through closing, once that deed is recorded and the keys exchange hands, that's it. Guys, with buying a home, there is no 60 day return policy. This isn't like Amazon Prime where you can send it back. Once that deed is recorded, it is a done deal. So why are we encouraging our buyers to do their inspections and investigations? Because they need to know what they're buying. And the seller's under no obligation to discuss it with them. There are risks involved in buying a house, yes. There's risks involved in lots of things in life, right? Anybody been on the interstate today? <laughs> There's risks involved. <laughs> And there is absolutely no difference to buying a house. So let's go ahead and take 10. And we come back, we'll keep looking at our contract.
All right. Welcome back. So we've taken attendance. And talking more about our offer to purchase and contract. Um, I found my one with highlights, so I'll put that in there tonight so we can see that tomorrow. So, okay, we talked about the buyer's due diligence process, making sure that they understand that closing constitutes acceptance of the property and is then existing condition. There are some representations that the buyer has to make to the seller. We're going to see in just a minute, there's some representations that the seller has to make to a buyer. Remember, these are bilateral contracts. They're two-way streets. So things. For example, that the buyer has to represent to the seller is, do they have the funds to complete the purchase? Um, we're gonna identify if this is a cash buyer, they don't have to go through a, a lender or get a loan, or if they are getting a loan, um, what's that loan information? So we're gonna identify the buyer's gonna represent. And again, um, we're gonna attach a pre-approval. We're gonna have a pre-approval with our offer so the seller knows that they've at least had a conversation with the lender but the pre-approval is no guarantee 
there's still the whole loan process that we have to go through once we get under contract. Um, does the buyer have other property to sell? This isn't creating a contingency. The buyer's just representing to the seller that I may or may not have to sell or lease other property in order to qualify for a new loan. So the buyer's just letting the seller know. Um, it even reminds us this is not conditioned upon the sale. Yeah. Accidentally. Um, remember we talked about our RPODs and our MOB. The buyer needs to represent to the seller that they've received them or not. The buyer has to acknowledge receipt and then they have to identify that they have received. If they have not received a copy of these, then they may have an out. So whichever the following occurs first. Uh, we talked about the end of the third calendar day following receipt or the end of the third calendar day following the effective date. Or is the property exempt from the RPOs and the MOG? So the buyer's just representing to the seller if they have received these or not, or if they're exempt. Buyer's obligations. Here's our special assessments again. Any special assessment that's proposed before uh, settlement is going to be, let me, let me rephrase that. Any special assessment that's confirmed before settlement, we'll see will be the seller's responsibility. If there's any special assessments that are on the table for discussion and they're confirmed after settlement, then they're the buyer's responsibility. So the seller should represent to the buyer that there are anything that they're aware of. There are any special assessments in discussion, um, but the buyer is going to take subject to all special assessments that may be approved after settlement. Those would be the responsibilities of the buyer. Buyer's obligations, they're responsible for costs, all costs with respect to getting the loan, any charges by the owner's association. There's usually some kind of administrative fee or something there's paperwork involved to change homeowners so there's a fee there the contract appraisal title search title insurance there's our closing attorney recording the deed and preparing any documents necessary to purchase those are all in the buyer's responsibilities sellers got some representations to make to the buyer how long have they owned the property was the property built prior to, there's our magic year of 1978. If so, we're gonna attach the lead-based paint, lead-based paint hazard addendum. The seller needs to represent if they are in an owner's association and provide the buyer with homeowner's association documents. So there's our covenants, bylaws, articles of incorporation whatever document that may pertain to the HOA, the seller um, should release to the buyer. And then the seller needs to identify the owner's associations. So who is the association? The dues are X amount per, is that month, is that year, is that quarter, however that's broken down. And you'll notice we have a place here for two HOAs. Some places have two, some may have like, for example, a a mandatory HOA, and then an optional HOA like for the pool or the clubhouse. So if there's two different things going on, two different HOAs or two different things going on, or we have the ability or the seller has the ability to represent both. Seller needs to represent about any fuel tanks. To the best of the seller's knowledge, there is or is not a fuel tank on the property if yes, complete the following. So we've got descriptions and we got two different tanks that we can describe. So tank one is currently or not in use. Is it owned or leased? Where is it located? What kind of fuel is it? So seller still representing stuff to the buyer. Seller has obligations. 
Um, biggest seller's obligation is to provide clear marketable title. They need to be able to hand over that title free of liens uh, with the exception of any known encumbrances, for example. Seller has to provide the buyer reasonable access to the property. When we go under contract, the seller has to allow the buyer on the property to do their inspections and investigations. They can't deny the home inspector and the appraiser and the pest inspector. So they have to allow the buyer on, back on the property by making appointments, of course, we're not just gonna show up, but we have to allow the buyer and their representatives on the property so they can do their inspections and investigations. So they're allowed on the property to conduct their due diligence, um, verify satisfactory completion if we had any repairs. And then the other thing, up until closing, probably one of the very last things we're going to do on our way to the closing attorney's office is a final walkthrough. Remember that very important sentence we just saw that says this property is being, not that one, I'm sorry. Um, closing constitutes acceptance of the property in its current condition. So when the buyer signs at settlement, they're agreeing to take the property as it is right now. And if we don't do the final walkthrough, how do they know what they're accepting, right? Especially if you have never seen this home vacant. If the seller has lived there until three days prior to settlement and now it's vacant, definitely, but always do that final walkthrough so the buyer knows what they're accepting. So now the question comes in, what if? What if, what if? What if there's damage we didn't know? What if there's a big hole behind this picture, but we didn't know that because they just took this picture down and they moved out two days ago. And now they took it down and we see a big hole. What if there's a bunch of trash or debris or personal property left in the home? What if the buyer's not satisfied with the property in the final walkthrough? We pretty much got two choices. Either we go on to the attorney's office and sign and accept the property as it is, or we don't. Don't encourage your buyer to sign and we'll talk the seller into fixing it later. It's really important that we understand once the buyer signs, they're accepting the property. So if they want the seller to come clean up their trash or to come fix this big hole, then we need to get on the phone. We need to start negotiating. And we need to let the seller know. I don't know that my buyer is going to sign. You guys with me? Those are those choices. They sign and accept or they don't. And we try to figure it out. Keep in mind, we are on our way to the attorney's office. So if we do come to any agreements or arrangements to fix this, fix this hole or, you know, have the trash taken out, then we can have an attorney draft something up. But bottom line, once this buyer bought, once the buyer signs, that's it. They need to know, they deserve to know what they're signing. And that's the whole point of the final walkthrough. Comments on that? Seller is also obligated to provide existing utilities at the seller's cost um, up until settlement. It's kind of hard for the home inspector to inspect if they don't have power, right? So if the seller is moving out, they can't cut the power and the water until pretty much the day of settlement. Seller has to remove all their property, all personal property, which is not part of the part purchase and garbage and debris. Here's our good title and legal access. You guys may remember this paragraph. This was in, I think it was unit five. And we talked about all the words that we know now. Y'all remember this? General warranty deed and easements and fee simple marketable title and encumbrances and liens and all those words we learned in the first in the first couple units. It's pretty much all summed up right here in this paragraph. It 
seller is the one that's responsible for pay and the preparation of the deed. Uh, seller pays to have the deed prepared and any other documents necessary to perform the seller's obligations. So the seller has some payments, some money to pay as well. We'll break those down in unit 21. What are the debits to the seller? If there's any agreed upon closing costs, um, the seller may or the buyer may ask the seller to pay some of their closing costs, completely negotiable. The seller's under no obligation to agree to pay any of the buyer's closing costs. But if we do agree, then X amount, this is a big one. Remember we said, don't leave a blank blank. So if the seller's not gonna pay anything, we need to make sure that we put that in there. Don't let somebody collect some money, get some money. Seller's gonna pay in full at settlement, all special assessments that are approved prior to settlement. So anything that's been voted yay prior to settlement is the responsibility of the seller to pay in full before settlement. Anything that's approved after is the responsibility of the buyer. Seller pays delinquent taxes. That's their responsibility. Then we address negotiated repairs and improvements again. Remember, the seller doesn't have to agree to do any repairs. It's not uncommon for the buyer to ask, but the seller has some choices. They can agree to do some of those repairs, none of those repairs, or all of those repairs, but they are under no obligation to do anything. If they do agree to do any, our contract says they should be made in a good and workmanlike manner. And buyer has the right to verify those repairs and improvements prior to signing. Remember, they're signing, accepting it. So they need to make sure those repairs, they may wanna have their contractor come out and inspect it. They may wanna have the home inspector come back out and say, yeah, it's satisfactory now. I kind of think of the home inspector, I tend to think of the home inspectors like, the, um, like your general um, practitioner your, your, your uh, what do they call Physi physician's assistant. And when you go to the doctor every year for an annual checkup, your doctor knows a little bit about a whole lot of things, right? And if your doctor is looking at your, you know, studying you and looking at your reports and your lab results, if they have anything to make a little flag go up and cause concern, they generally send you on to a specialist, right? The home inspector is the same way. If they have a reason for a flag to go up, they're gonna say, something's up with the electrical, I suggest you talk to an electrician. Something's up with the plumber, I suggest, or the plumbing, I suggest you talk to a plumber. The home inspector, generally speaking, knows and can only report on what they find wrong. But as far as diagnosing the problem and looking into it further, they're gonna recommend the buyer talk to that specialist. So we might need to specify who we want to do those repairs. You know, if you have electrical work, we may want to consider specifying we want a certified electrician to come in and handle that instead of letting the, the seller with a, with a YouTube video and a hammer say, yeah, 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 I can fix this. I got this. So we may want to specify something big like that, that we want it to be handled by a professional, by a certified person. Um, charges by the owners association. Again, a nice little breakdown of what we just talked about. Seller pays for things that are approved prior to settlement. Buyer pays things that are approved after settlement. Various things that we're going to prorate. We touched on proration at the end of unit three. Remember when we calculated annual ta taxes? And remember we said, if you're buying my house today, is it fair for either one of us to pay the full year's taxes? I mean, you only own it for 11 months. I own it for one. So it's not really fair, right? So how are we going to make it fair? We're going to prorate. We're going to make it fair at closing. When we get to unit 21, we get to prorate. We get to pick up our calculator and learn if you're going to pay 11 months taxes or, you know, 265 days of taxes, 
We're going to pick our calculator up on the unit 21 and learn, talk more about prorating, making shared expenses fair, uh, risk of loss. This one's always interesting. If the property is damaged, if it's severely damaged, maybe it burns down while we're under contract, for example. If the house burns down when we're under contract, it's not over yet. If the house burns down, the buyer has choices. They may terminate this contract. And if so, they will get their due diligence and their earnest money fee back. Remember we said there's only two times the due diligence fee is gonna go back to the buyer. That's if the seller breaches or there's major destruction of the property. So the contract addresses that. If the buyer chooses not to terminate, they're gonna be entitled to receive in addition to the property, the proceeds of any insurance claim filed by the seller. So if the house burns down, the buyer has a choice. You either terminate and get your earnest money and deposit and a due diligence fee back, or you continue on and buy the property and you will get the proceeds of the seller's insurance to rebuild. If I were a buyer's agent in this situation, I would encourage my buyer to make two phone calls, one to their attorney first, and second, to the seller's insurance company. I don't know if you guys know this, but insurance companies aren't necessarily known for their rapid payouts. So if there's gonna be any hiccups, if there's gonna be any things that we're gonna run into, I think that's all things that the buyer needs to take into consideration when they're making this decision to terminate or not. The second piece of this says that the risk of loss is on the seller through settlement. The seller has got to keep homeowner's insurance until that new deed is recorded because it is still the seller's home until or the seller's property until that new deed is recorded. So they need to keep insurance. They are still responsible for any risk of loss or damage. Uh, again, we got a whole unit dedicated to insurance. So we'll talk about that more in detail when we get to unit 13. Questions or comments on that? I always find that interesting. Is that interesting? House burns down, what do you do? Well, we got decisions to make. Now, that insurance comment, is that a, I don't see in there that it's a requirement. Is there a strong recommendation? Because some people actually don't have homeowner's insurance. So that would be why I'm having my buyer make some phone calls before they make a decision. Cause you're absolutely right. If you don't have a loan, you're not required to have homeowner's insurance. So before you make that decision, we got some questions. We got to find out some things, don't we? So let's call our attorney and then ask the seller, hey, who do you have? We don't have anybody. Well, that's going to help in my decision, isn't it? Is there a, I don't see a time frame in there. How soon does the buyer have to make that decision? Uh, there, I mean, there isn't. What, I mean, it could burn down the day of closing, right? You could get that phone call on your way to the closing attorney's office. And you're right, there is no time frame. So that tells me they have time to make some phone calls and to learn a little bit more about it. Could you imagine you're on your way to the attorney's office? And your phone rings and they say, yeah, we got a problem. House burned down. Things happen on closing days, you guys. I have a private Facebook group, a couple of them. And there was a guy not too long ago said they went to closing. He took his buyers to close or settlement. He took his buyers to settlement. Seller never showed, seller never showed, seller never showed. Couldn't get them on the phone, couldn't figure out what's going on. Seller gone totally MIA. They finally gave up and left and said, well, I hope we learn something soon. Y'all want to know what happened to the seller? He got arrested that morning. <laughs> he was sitting in jail. <laughs> I guess he didn't make his one phone call <laughs> to the closing attorney to let them know that he wasn't going to show up that day. Things happen on closing day. 
Sometimes we're just going to roll with the punches. You know what I'm saying? I have no idea what happened to that outcome. That's a bad day to go to jail right there, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, never a good day to go to jail. Uh, delay in settlement and closing. Delays in settlement are common. Delays in settlement just happen. Unfortunately, I don't have a crystal ball, so I can't tell you what may go wrong. I cannot tell you what may cause a delay. But what I do know is delays happen, delays are common. So we have to have a provision in here that discusses delays. Um, one of the biggest delays, has anybody ever done new construction? New construction is almost always <laughs> guaranteed a delay because you know, days like this where it's so rainy, you can't get out and build, right? I mean, what if, you know, last couple of years we've been dealing with labor and supply shortages. So if you're waiting on windows and the windows don't come, you have a delay. So our contract takes that into consideration and our contract builds in a seven day delay. So what this is saying is that we agree on the settlement date back on page three or two, we agreed on a settlement date. But if we can't close on that date, then we have wiggle room of seven days to make it happen. The non-delaying party, in other words, the party that didn't cause the delay, basically has to sit still and be patient for those seven days. If they terminate, they're in breach. On day eight, if we still haven't closed, they can terminate and get their, their remedies for breach but delays are common. They just happen. I always tell my buyers and sellers to have a plan B. Always. Because if it doesn't close, I don't want anybody sleeping in the U-Haul truck tonight. So I always tell them to have a plan B. We're all going to work really hard to make this happen, but things just happen. What if we don't have loan approval yet? What if it's new construction? What if, what if, what if? So the contract takes that into consideration and gives us a seven day delay if need be. The contract identifies when possession is. When does the buyer get to take possession? Possession includes keys, codes, security codes, garage door openers, et cetera. The buyer should not, should not, be given access to the property until closing, until that deed has changed hands. There are a kajillion stories out there. You all probably have, if not personal experience, but there are stories out there where the buyer gets the keys at the attorney's office and they run to the house before the deed's ever been recorded. It's not their home yet. It's not their property. What if they walk in the front door and fall down and trip and hurt themselves? It's still the seller's home. Who's liable for that? Whose insurance has to pick that up? It's not the buyer's property yet. So there's still things that can happen. And it's really important that we safeguard those and we honor the contract. Make sure that the buyer doesn't get access until closing. If we're gonna make other arrangements for possession, um, maybe that is already in possession by the tenant, uh, maybe we do a buyer possession before closing or a seller possession after closing. In both of these cases, one party's acting like the landlord and the other party's acting like the tenant. We're gonna talk just a little bit more about those when we get to our insurance unit. But my point now is that possession can be negotiable, but unless agreed otherwise, the buyer shouldn't be getting access until it is closed. Various addenda. One thing I like a whole lot about our contract, and if you guys you know, get the chance, um, by the way, we're going through this sucker word for word and post-licensing. So again, we're just introducing you to some of the bigger concepts to it now. When we get into post-licensing, we're going nitty gritty. And remember, you guys are helping your buyers and sellers, so you need to be familiar with it anyway. So it all starts in post if you don't do a deal before then. But scattered throughout our contract, 
when the need arises to use a form, the contract will tell us. For example, you see where it says, consider attaching the additional provisions addendum or the vacation rental addendum. So throughout the whole contract, if a need to use a form comes up, the contract is very helpful. And it says, if this happens, you need this form. So now we have all of the commonly used addenda. This certainly is not all of them, but this is a list of some of the more commonly used addenda. We kind of use it as a checklist to make sure I got all applicable addenda. Every transaction is different. So we want to make sure that we got it all, that we've included it, because if you don't add it, it doesn't become part of the offer and eventually the contract. So buyer's agents, when you're presenting that offer, we need to make sure that all applicable addenda, we're going to talk about most of these tomorrow night. Um, again, if they're in the syllabus, we're going to discuss them. You guys don't need to study these forms yet. So we're going to introduce you to the basic idea of what they do. I think if you get a test question on these, it's going to give you a scenario. And then it's going to say which addenda would apply. So we just need that basic understanding. We'll talk about those tomorrow night. Here's a note, just in case we forget, we're reminded. We are not attorneys. I cannot draft addenda. I cannot draft contracts. I can't draft. Another note reminding us here. Remember last night we talked about an assignment. We said with an assignment, all the terms stay the same. The only thing that changes is the names of one of the parties. So our contract says it may not be assigned without the written consent of all parties. So could our contract be assigned? Sure, as long as we have everybody's permission. We'll talk about tax deferred exchange. Unit 18 is, I call it our accounting unit. So we'll briefly mention that there. I do want to point this out because I always get some really strange looks. Remember when we said that death is only an out when you're negotiating the offer? Once you're under contract, death is not an out. And all you went, what? So here it is. This contract shall be binding upon and shall inure to the benefit of the buyer and the seller and their heirs. When do heirs kick in? When either party passes away. So it's binding on the benefit, or excuse me, to the buyer and the seller and their heirs once we're under contract. Death is not an out. The last little piece here, uh, please make a note on page 13. I would hate that they put this at the very end, but page 13, provision 23, talks about the remedies. So we talk about breach by the buyer, breach by the seller. Um, breach by the buyer, if the buyer breaches, the seller shall be entitled to the earnest money deposit. Um, the payment of the earnest money deposit and any due diligence fee to the seller shall serve as the seller's liquidated damages and is the seller's sole and exclusive remedy for such breach. Buyer's not in breach until after due diligence. And if the buyer breaches, the seller keeps the due diligence, they get the earnest money and that's it. The seller can't sue the buyer. The seller can't go after the buyer for more money. I mean, they can try, right? But a judge is going to pick the contract up and say, well, it says right here, you accept that liquidated damages as your sole and exclusive remedy. If the seller breaches, the buyer may elect to terminate as a result of the breach. They shall be entitled to the return of both the earnest money and the due diligence fee together with reasonable costs actually incurred. That goes back to our uh, talking about our due diligence costs. This goes back to our compensatory damages. If the seller breaches, the buyer can prove I've had the home inspection done. I've had the appraisal done. I've had the pest inspection done. 
the buyer can prove with invoices and receipts that they paid money towards this transaction, towards this property. And now that the seller has breached, the buyer could go after them to get that money back. That's that due diligence cost. Any money that they've already spent in connection to this transaction. Or the buyer could elect not to terminate um, and seek the remedy of, there's our specific performance. So if they terminate, they're entitled to their monies or they could stay under contract, take the buyer to or the seller to court. Remember specific performance, if the buyer wins, the judge can make the seller perform, which means the judge can make the seller sell. Attorney fees, if anybody has to take anybody to court over breach, not only are you going to be entitled for the terms of the contract, but the let's call them the losing party may have to pay both sides attorney's fees. So if you breach and they take you to court, not only will you have to pay in terms of the contract, but you could also have to pay your attorney's fees and the other party's attorney's fees. And then we have the last official page of the contract is where we get everybody to sign. Buyer signs on the left, seller signs on the right. Uh, once again, we got a place for only two buyers and only two sellers to sign the contract. If you need more than two, we have our additional signatures addendum. We need to get everybody's signature that is buying and selling. So that's what that additional signatures addendum is for. If it's an entity buyer or seller, then we list them there. There's our wire fraud warning again to both parties. Uh, make sure you're contacting the closing attorney's office directly through a number that you obtained on your own to get that wire or give that wire transfer instructions. Don't email it. It's not secure. Then here's our notice information. How do we want to be contacted? So we could put um, our buyers and sellers contact information. More likely what we're going to see is us. And this is the only place in the contract that we belong. Buyer on the left, seller on the right. So you got your selling firm, who is the firm, and we have to identify their role. Is the firm acting as a buyer's agent, a seller sub agent, or a dual agent? I'm gonna put the firm license number, mailing address, and then we're gonna identify the individual selling agent and whether or not the individual agent is acting as a designated dual agent. There's your license number, your account information, your contact information, excuse me. And then we go through that same little exercise with sellers on the right. Who's the listing firm? Are they acting as a seller's agent or a dual agent? Who's the individual agent and whether or not they're acting as a designated with their contact information. This is the only place that we belong in the sales contract. And the reason we're here is to confirm my agency role and to provide you with my contact information. I'm not signing anything. I'm not a party to the contract. But if they need to get in touch with me, they need to know how. We need to know how we want to communicate. And then the last page, 16 pages, is acknowledgement of receipts of money. So basically what this form is for when we go under contract, the buyer is a seller due diligence. And generally speaking, the way this works, we go under contract, yay, do your little contract happy dance because it's always a good day to go under contract. So yay. Um, agent, buyer's agent will probably meet up with the buyer somewhere to get those checks, cashier's checks, money orders, however they're going to pay, the due diligence and the earnest money. Buyer's agent 
will generally deliver the due diligence fee to the listing agent. Once the listing agent receives the due diligence fee, they need to sign acknowledging receipt. They need to sign that they have received that due diligence fee. Then the listing agent generally gets that to the seller and which the seller acknowledges receipt. So they have to acknowledge that they received it. So there's no question later. Can we all agree that in your hand and on its way are two totally different things? Can we all agree with that? Yeah. Y'all don't sign for this until it's in your hand. If they tell you they're going to drop it off this afternoon, just go ahead and leave me the signed paperwork at the front desk and I'll pick it up. No. Lots can happen between now and then, right? Guys, there have been cases down at the commission where the due diligence has gone missing. Just disappeared. Nobody, seller never got it. They went to the agent and said, what did you do with it? And the agent said, well, I never got it. And they said, you signed saying you did. So... Do not sign for this. Do not have your seller sign for this until you or they actually have it in their hand. And then the escrow agent has to sign acknowledging earnest money. So again, the buyer's agent meets the buyer, picks up the two checks, and then the buyer's agent is going to deliver the due diligence to the listing agent and the earnest money to the escrow agent. Pretty much anybody that touches it has to sign acknowledging receipt. That is your 16 page offer to purchase and contract. Y'all ready for this? I bought my little condo in 2006 and it's 23 now. So how long have I had it? 16 years? 16 years ago, the offer to purchase and contract was eight pages. We have doubled this thing. And you know what? <laughs> I wouldn't be, I'm not, I don't get surprised anymore. I've seen these numbers go up. We were just 15 pages last year, probably not too, 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 too far away from 17. Anytime there's an issue between the buyer and the seller, the forms committee considers it and sees if they need to add something to make it clear, something to prevent this happening. Again, uh, I've heard once that all the items in the fixture list are the result of a lawsuit after closing. Buyer sues seller because they thought the ceiling fan should be there, for example. And that's why we have the fixture list. So don't get too comfortable with 16 because these things, this thing grows. And the other thing we've kind of, you know, alluded to or kind of discussed Buyers and sellers, even if you do have a reader, buyers and sellers generally don't understand all the provisions. You guys just met this thing. Is it a little intimidating? Is it a little overwhelming? You can be honest with me. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. It's a legally binding form, right? They say that this thing is written on the level of a first year law student. So it's, it's a contract. It's a legally binding document. And guys, I had a teammate that had a seller with, with 45 offers. So 16 times 45 is 720 pieces of paper that we're sending that seller saying, figure out which offer you want to accept. That's why they have me. They have me to help them sort through those 45 offers. They have me to help them understand what are the terms. It's more than the purchase price. It's taken everything into consideration. Are they offering, in the seller's opinion, adequate amount of due diligence fee? And the seller's opinion, are they offering adequate amount of earnest money deposit? But the seller doesn't know that until we help them understand what due diligence and earnest money was. Same thing to the buyer. What are you willing to risk? Remember, all buyers have a different risk tolerance. And unfortunately, the ones that won in the last couple of years, are the ones that are willing to put down, I heard of six digit due diligence fees. If you were the seller and somebody is offering you $100,000 in due diligence, how does that make their offer look? Not too shabby. So how were buyers winning? It wasn't just always about the purchase price. Yes, some of it was, 
but we have other points to negotiate. When the seller gets an offer, they generally care about two things, how much and when. How much are they offering and when do they want to close? But that's why we have, that's why they have us and we have this understanding of how this thing works of all the terms so we can best assist our client. I mean, think about it. it kind of depends on what hat I'm wearing, right? If I'm a listing agent, I want my seller to get the most amount as possible. If I'm the buyer's agent, I want my buyer to pay the least possible. And now we just got to get the two to meet somewhere in the middle. The other thing I want to point out, this form, I like it. It serves two purposes. Starts as an offer to purchase and upon acceptance becomes a contract. Again, thank you forms committee for lumping it all together and not having two separate forms for that. What questions do I have? What comments? It's a lot, I know. It looks like they really made an effort to help um, in clarifying all the terms and everything on these forms. So it's nice. I, I, I agree, Carrie. I and, and, you know, you guys in pre and um, post licensing, you know, we spend a lot of time because they actually define these things. They actually tell you what the heck an earnest money deposit is. Um, and I, I agree. That's part. That's a big part of what this is, is just telling the people what it is. So this contract goes in when you say that they want the, um, basically they're interested in the house and then you go straight to doing this contract since it's like the offer and the contract. Mm -hmm. So you don't have, so do you talk about all the offers beforehand or you just wait and do this all at once? You know, honestly, it depends. So, you know, it might depend on the buyer, depend on how anxious they are. Um, but at some point, because buyer walks in the front door, we're showing them property, buyer walks in the front door, they fall in love and they say, write it up. I'm now helping my buyer fill in the blanks. So I'm asking them, you know, how much do you want to purchase? Or how much your purchase price? You know, I'm doing a CMA to help them determine that purchase price. I'm asking them, this is due diligence. You will not get this money back. How much are you willing to risk? You know, this is earnest money, right? So when I'm helping my buyer write it up, we're going through these lines, you know, I, I say together, sometimes it's over the phone. Sometimes we are sitting face to face. I actually prefer that, you know, let's go to the conference room at my office and we can sit down and talk about these things. But every situation is a little bit different. So it just depends. Um, and Nicola, same thing with the sellers. When I'm the listing agent, and I get this thing from the buyer's agent, all the blanks are filled in and the buyer signed it, but I'm not just gonna hand it to my seller and say, okay, here you go, let me know what you wanna do. I'm gonna talk to my seller about what the due diligence means, the earnest money. So always remember you guys, I'm a fact finder. I provide the information for them to make an informed decision. I can recommend my seller counter. I can recommend my buyer offer more. Right. I can make recommendations all day long, but bottom line, these decisions are up to them. So typically, how long does it take to like do this contract? You know, again, it just depends how much negotiation do we have to do? You know, are we going to have to go back and forth a couple times? So um, buyer's agent once sent an offer in, listing agent called, said, my seller accepts. Huh? No count. I mean, it was a decent offer. It wasn't like a wow offer. It was a decent offer, you know? And they were like, nope, she's good. It's signed. Here you go. We're under contract. All right. Zero negotiations. Sometimes you go back and forth. Sometimes we get petty. Not we, they get petty. 
Uh, somebody says, so in this form, the buyer signs first, then if the seller agrees to everything they sign or do both parties sign together. So the offer or, generally speaking, is the buyer, but the offer or is going to fill in the blanks and sign, present it to the offeree. If the offeree accepts, they're going to sign it. And then we have communication of acceptance crossing the line. So are they both going to sign it together? You know, the original offer needs to be completed and signed by the buyer, the offer or. I know tonight wasn't the most fun night. I get it. Forms, not fun. Let's just go ahead and put that out there. Not much fun about forms, is there? You know what a big part of real estate is? Forms. We looked at our agency agreements. We looked at our offer to purchase and contract. I'll get the highlights in there um, in our online learning system. So you guys help you guys better focus, know what to focus on. We'll talk about other forms, but off the top of my head, I don't think we go through any other forms. So when it comes to reviewing the forms, your two agency agreements and the offer to purchase and contract, the rest you will meet eventually. We're doing this one step at a time. So tomorrow we're going to discuss some commonly used addenda, but we're not going to look at the forms. So we're going to talk about things but we don't have to look at any more forms. Is that good news? Okay. I promise we'll try to have more fun tomorrow. No more forms. Okay. Anything else? All right. Tomorrow night, we finish up unit 10. Uh, we're starting on page 293. Again, talking about some of the more commonly used addenda. We're going to weigh through unit 10. Also tomorrow night, we're going to talk about this midterm and how we're going to handle this. So we'll have that conversation tomorrow night as well. Okay. Okay. Y'all have a good evening. We'll see you guys tomorrow night.